Good evening. We're here with uh, Fran Sanders. She is the director and has been the director of public poetry. Uh, she will admit to being a graduate of the University of Wisconsin. <laughs> she has worked uh, for 18 years in visual arts. Uh, she ran the Lawndale Enquirer magazine, worked with international dance companies. She spent 16 years uh, in Poets Corner uh, taping poetry read by poets for visually impaired people. Uh, she ran the Art Lines uh, contest in conjunction with the Museum of Fine Arts. Uh, and most famously, or currently, uh, she is the director of public poetry, which is paired with the uh, Houston libraries and has been bringing poets uh, to Houston uh, uh, local libraries for 16 years. No, 12, 13. 12 going years. On 13. Okay, sorry. 12 going on 13. 12 going on. Oh, excellent. It's, you know, it's a wonderful program, and we're so, so pleased to be able to talk about it. What are you doing next, Fran? Well, um, making a bunch of changes. I'm delighted to say that I no longer have the same role that I've had for all these years with public poetry, and I've now turned over um many of the things that I've done to a fabulous new group of people and I'm really excited about what they're doing and how they're doing it and um what that does is allow me to do what I want to do which for right now is real poetry which is about the intersection of poetry and film or video. And we will have our sixth festival coming up uh, the first week in April. And um, in the same way that public poetry has been a kind of sampling of not only um, different kinds of poetry, but also a different representatives of the kinds of things that are going on now, whether it's spoken word or whether it's from academia. In the same way, um, real poetry is a kind of sampling, but it is international. Um, and I think it reflects some of the most exciting work being done today. I also think that it's pretty important for poets in this age of electronic marvels and, and AI and all of that to at least make a stab at what will now be old school technology by recording their work. Um, and doing more than just recording it, I think they should be as creative as possible with that, whether it's just using a cell phone or, you know, actually going into a studio, whether it's collaborating with other artists, but um, I just think it's important for that visual record to be there as well. Okay, we'll look forward to that. Fran, you know it's coming. Uh, here come the questions. Where was or is your favorite place to read a poem? Um, where was, was up a tree. When I was younger, I would read everything up a tree. I had a fabulous tree at the side of our house that I would climb and take books with me and spend the as much time as I possibly could there. Um, where it is now, having recently moved to an apartment, I actually have a, a room that's a reading room. Prior to that, I had a chair that was wedged between um, bookcases where I would read. But having this and having a small, lovely windowless room where I can be with some of my favorite books, people who know me know I have a pop-up book collection and it's there um, in that room where I 
choose to read and love to read. Oh. Okay, what was the first poem you remember getting? Do you remember? Oh, without a doubt, twas brillig and the slithy toes did gyre and gimbal in the wave, all mimsy were the burrow groves and the moan rats outgrave. Uh, <laughs> I absolutely love that. And um, I'm not sure at what age I was first, it was first read to me because it would have been read to me. Um, but um, I think that that had a, played a significant role in my love of nonsense and language and sheer imagination. Oh. That uh, uh, comes as a surprise, but not but not a big one. Uh, <laughs> if if you could, what have, were you expecting, Dom? <laughs> no, it's all of these. You know, it's all uh, everything is a surprise to me. That's that's why I'm, I, I enjoy asking the questions. Uh, if you could ask any question of a past artist or writer, who would that be, and what would that question be? Mm. I'm not very well prepared for that one. I'd probably ask them, what's the meaning of life? <laughs> just, hope just, the, because, hope the best, yeah. just because I think that's just such a difficult question to say. Um, I mean, I can say something about the people who I am, who I keep with me. Um, actually, no, I think I might choose this and to ask its author. This is one of the most beautiful books for people who are bibliophiles what's, and love. What's the title? Because sometimes people can read it. It's called, I'm sorry, The Merchant of Marvels. Mm -hmm. And, um, who's, who's the author? Frederic Clement, okay. he's French, um, obviously. So what I love about it, I love it as a book. And it begins, will you, can you be tempted? And it's a combination of the most beautiful, well, first of all, it's on absolutely gorgeous paper. Uh, <laughs> so for people who like to feel pages, this is a good one. And it is just full of fantasy, imagination, stunning typography with little images in it. So what would I ask him? Hmm. I'd ask him, I'd ask him how he found his love of books and how he how he gets the type to be so incredibly expressive because I think you know that's something that that poets sometimes play with on a page um but you you don't see them playing with the type itself you see them playing with the line breaks perhaps creating a shape with a poem but this takes that one step further and it's gorgeous. Oh, wow. There you go. That's fabulous. Okay. Let's go to let's go to our next one. What do you think contemporary writing gets right? And what do you think it misses? I think what it gets right is um a certain enthusiasm for the work. Um, I think a sense of speaking truth to power, although that's very cliched in a way, and, and that's always been there um, for some people. Um, I think... What it gets right is trying to, to be more expansive um, 
both both in the literal sense of that and in a metaphorical sense as well. Um, what it doesn't do often enough is, especially right at this moment in time when things seem very, very, uh, when so much poetry seems very, very deeply personal. I mean, you know, bordering on memoir given different line breaks. Um, I almost feel like I'd like to see something more, more to do with more universal themes and more to do with the beauty of the language itself. Wonderful. And it's, I don't know whether you would agree or disagree. It's just I agree with you completely. Whatever you say, <laughs> of course you do. Now I'm not. I'm not. I'm not allowed to have opinions in my job. Here, I'll give. I'll give you the favorite question we've got. If you had to get rid of all of your books except what would fit in one box, cardboard box, uh, what would be in that box? What books would be in there? Mm. Hopefully you won't have to, but you understand. Well, obviously the book I alluded to earlier. Mm -hmm. um, I also managed to acquire some years back um, some volumes that were deacquisition from Rice's Fondren Library of Life magazine. Uh, all the And I managed to get all of the volumes from the very late 40s through the 50s and I think maybe one or two in the 60s and I would definitely take one of them although I can't say for sure which volume I take depending on but I would definitely take one of those I definitely take a book of Tony Hoagland's poems I definitely take um oh I mean, there are so many poets I would take. I would take Neruda. I would um, take um, I take Cyrus Cassell's. I'd take, um, I mean, I think I, I don't know. The Life magazine, the Life books are pretty big volumes. I think I've almost filled it up. And I'd take um, Dave Hickey's book, which I will talk about in a minute. Oh, okay. Uh, what makes something art? Ah, this is where I get to talk uh, about Dave Hickey and uh, the invisible dragon. Four essays on beauty. Um, so Dave is an astonishing writer, and he's talking about visual arts. Um, he's He was in Texas. He's not around anymore. Um, but, and actually, he's probably the dead person I talked to. I may be getting ahead of myself with these questions. Okay. Um, but that's all right. I mean, yeah. there you go. Um. So the qu the question you were actually asking was what makes something art? What makes something art? Yeah. Um all right, I will So I actually think something becomes art as opposed to object if you're thinking about visual arts um art if if you're thinking of artistry for example the art or even the art of poetry um where i would say that the beginning stage of that is a grounding in craft and then you build upon that for poetry to, to really speak as an art form i think um but then that may be a bit old school of me who knows um, <laughs> I think that if it fires your imagination, um, if it arouses curiosity, if it 
take something that you would normally completely overlook um, and really bring it into very, very sharp focus. I think those are some of the traits or characteristics of art. Um, I can't say that it makes it art. Um, I will read actually a little bit of what Dave Hickey wrote because because I underlined it and I wanted to read it. It's so I'll try to read it. <laughs> um, and he's, he's talking about uh, visual imagery, plastic arts, if you will, but he says imagery, but this also I think applies to, to poetry as well. So you can substitute the word poetry for imagery if you like. Imagery is always presumed to be proposing something contestable and controversial. This is the sheer, ebullient, slitheringly dangerous fun of it. No image is presumed inviolable in our dance hall of visual politics, and all images are potentially powerful. Bad graphics topple good governments and occlude good ideas. Good graphics sustain bad ones. The fluid nuancing of pleasure, power, and beauty is a serious ongoing business in this culture. And so I hope that will entice you to read a little bit of Dave Hickey, but also... And, um, and, the, and the title of that one again is... The Invisible Dragon. Invisible Dragon. Okay, thank you. He is dead, so that if the dead poet, if the dead question is next, then I the, will... the, these answers are not graded, Fred. You're you're good. You're good. <laughs> don't worry. You don't have to go back and pencil what in. Okay. You ready for the next one? I am. Okay. What poem would you read to your father? Oh, my God. All right. I will start by saying that I wouldn't read any poem to my father. <laughs> well, that makes it um, more and more exciting. My father was a Jew raised by Jesuits. And for him, both Latin and Greek were spoken living languages. And so um, I think he would expect me not to read, but to recite something for him in either Latin or Greek, or Greek neither of which I'm capable of doing. So um, I did end up stumbling across a poem that I decided he might not be too offended by, but I, I really couldn't say. It's um, Ron Paget. How long? From okay. Ron Paget. It's called Thinking About a Cloud. There's not a lot of time to think when one is assailed by activities and obligations, and even less time to do it when one is free of them because then one spends one's time thinking about how little time there is. That's what it's like to be in America early in the 21st century. There are fewer spaces left between things. And it is in those spaces that thought comes forth and walks around and lies down, sometimes all at the same time. It is so elastic and like an alto cumulus cloud with a sense of humor. Hello, cloud. It's nice to see you again, it says. A cloud does not reply. It is a reply. But you just answered me. No, that was you answering yourself. But you enabled me to do so, didn't you? Yes, but only because you believed it possible. Are you implying that anything I believe possible will happen? No, I never imply anything. In fact, I never say anything. Oh, I forgot. It's just that it's hard for me to talk with you, knowing you don't talk. What makes you think it matters? I don't know. 
Perhaps my belief that we may as well think that it matters, for otherwise we would sit down and turn into a puddle. You are the first person ever to use the word puddle in a poem, said the cloud. Please don't do it again. I was thinking of you, how high up you are. And yet sometimes even you become a puddle. I never become anything. You forget, I am not a cloud. I forgot because I thought you might go away before I had a chance to talk with you. Well, you've had your chance and perhaps you will have others later. But for now, even as I speak, you feel me slipping away. Yes, I do. It's like knowing something terrible, little by little. Don't use the word little so much either. You're a grown-up now. Are there grown-up clouds too? You sound like one. I sound like one because I'm almost gone. And when I'm gone, you will hear only the sound of your own personality as it rises in you and pushes me away. Don't you hear it now? Thank you. That was wonderful. Thank you for all you've done. Thank <laughs> you for being here tonight. Uh, we're done. Thanks. You're very welcome. It was a pleasure, Dom. <laughs> <laughs>